So Russia has invaded Ukraine. Good for them. I, I can see they're really doing well. Before we begin, I have the general problem that every time I sit down to record something on this, we get another major update and I want to talk about it. But this is now the third time that I've sat and re-recorded this, and right now I just can't be arsed doing it again. So if by the time this goes out something else has come along and done something, I don't care. Short of Putin deploying nukes, which honestly wouldn't surprise me, assume I know we're just a couple of hours behind between, you know, me recording and you actually watching this, you know, whenever it goes out. Now, I've I've been away visiting an ill family member, I, I got back not that long ago, and I'm very tired in a way that you only get when you're on a Ryanair flight, which if you've never had the joy of experiencing, uh, then imagine a plane with zero legroom, a seat so tight you cannot physically not touch the person next to you, and you can't sleep because every 30 seconds the flight attendants are trying to sell you something. Something. You put your head against the vibrating glass, try to get some shut eye, and all of a sudden, uh, we're coming around with scratch cards. They're only a euro, and they help children all over the world by allowing us to pay less tax because a portion of a profit that you paid for goes to charity. Also, you can win a voucher. So, getting caught up in everything that has happened has been somewhat painful of an experience. Because for some reason I am stupid enough to keep forgetting that expecting the mainstream media to give a non-bias and detailed information on the goings on and not just point at explosions and go, ah, horrors, is a fruitless endeavor. So in my tired anger and frustration, my choice of language may degrade to what YouTube describes as violent and sexual imagery. So I just want to give you fair warning, okay? Anyway, it's good to know that just like the czars of the old, after granting himself a billion dollar palace, a gigantic luxury yacht, and a general lifestyle that would make the Sultan of Brunei envious, while well, his disastrous leadership has turned Russia from a progressive economical powerhouse into something that has a higher rich poor divide than most third world nations. Putin being the mentally spiring mad lad he is, falls back on the same old tried and tested distraction method as every other Russian dictator before him randomly declare war on something. Fun times, I know. So people have been expecting me to give some sort of analysis to this, which I'm fully unqualified to give, but here goes. I have no idea what the fuck is going on, and to a point, neither do you. War is chaos, okay? Especially a war like this one, where we have, let's be honest, a country who spends almost as much money as anything else chest-thumping itself with memes across the internet, trying to prove itself as some sort of major military power to 12-year-olds for no fucking reason, other than to try and convince its own population that it's still a major world superpower and not a comedically dying influence in world politics, also known as the British Empire Syndrome. And another country who has presented footage of video games as combat footage and has blatantly claimed a lot of the bullshit Twitter made up as a joke to be true because it makes them look good. But you know, I don't know, maybe there really is a guy swimming around the Black Sea with a knife destroying submarines. In my heart I want to believe it, even if I know that's complete and fucking bullshit. As such we have such a vast mix of reports from all manner of news sources, each determined to be the first to get that big scoop and cash in and all those clicks, meaning there is little, if any, effort to actually fact check what is being suggested. I believe it was Terry Pratchett who said the lie can get twice around the world before the truth has got its boots on. Then on top of that you have all the social media, and my uncle knows a guy who knows a guy who has a vegetable shop in Kiev, and, and I personally interviewed every soldier in Russia and wrote it down, and I've actually been to an archive so I know things, buddy. And of course the propaganda from both sides, it's a mess, so fuck knows what's actually going on. So I have about 30 tabs open right now, just switching between things, but, but honestly, this live map and r slash non-credible defense have been so far the two most reliable sources of information, which I think says a lot about our society today. So this is what I know from analyzing the situation from my previous military intelligence background that was not important enough to mention up until now, which I'll be honest was just me in a dark room screaming most of the time. I scream at my problems, that's how men do it. I am an adult. And it is. I mean, how can we put this delicately? It's embarrassing. I, I, I mean, what we're watching here is the laser pig loop in effect, which 
I can't believe I'm actually getting an example to prove it to you. Russia has learned nothing, absolutely nothing since 1945, and it's both amusing and somewhat satisfying to watch them make the exact same mistakes Nazi Germany did when it invaded the Soviet Union. Let's start with day one, that, that opening barrage. So. Let's compare it to Operation Desert Storm. That relied on a two-fold opening barrage. The coalition on day one demands air superiority over Iraq, and, and thus its initial targets are anything which can threaten that. They launch gigantic formations of aircraft every night that does nothing but circle around Saudi Arabia. So when Iraq sees those formations of aircraft taking off at zero hour, they're they're not suspicious, they've seen it every night. And when the air war does begin, it starts through the mass use of stealth aircraft, which go for communication systems. I mean, famously in the war room, all the journals were watching a live CNN broadcast from Baghdad, knowing that when the signal from that broadcast was cut, the F-117s had been successful. And while all this is going on, you've got cruise missiles striking at power plants, communication arrays, command stations, bunkers, important government buildings. You've got Apaches attacking radar installations, and behind them follows the F-111s with their radar jamming equipment, and behind them follows the bulk of the Air Force. All this does is create mass confusion and panic. It prevents the Iraqi forces from being able to communicate and scramble effectively. They don't know what's going on, they don't know what's attacking them, they don't know where. And when they do get those fighters in the air, there are F-15s and tornadoes flying overhead, just, just waiting on them. They use glider drones to trick anti-air defences into opening fire, so when the seed aircraft come in behind, all those systems are lit up like a fucking Christmas tree. And on top of that, you got B-52s spam bombing Iraqi positions, which in all the confusion is causing a lot of them to just desert their posts and run. And behind them, the GR-1s, the heavy anti-runway cluster munitions like the one I showed here, knock out key airfields, commercial airport, so any Iraqi aircraft left now cannot get airborne. Air superiority is achieved within hours of day one, after which the mission starts to switch to anything that can threaten the follow-up ground campaign. Day one of Desert Storm is a fucking masterpiece. It is art. It is a beauty to behold and watch. The Russian opening assault on Ukraine was embarrassing. While journalists will shit themselves over any explosion, the initial shock and awe of Russia's day one assault seemed to be targeting mostly airfields and random bits of field in the middle of nowhere, places they seem to think anti-air defences might be, which is probably why the opening assault seems to be somewhat sporadic. They managed to hit a few military targets, but also a lot of open fields, civilian homes and apparently a children's cancer ward. Go Russia! The Russian seed operations were done with largely unsuitable aircraft, using pilots which had not been trained on how to perform such operations, and thus seemed to have been utterly ineffective. It's actually not really known to any reasonable degree of accuracy if they fucking hit anything. I mean, just recently, they fired a missile at an airfield and hit a block of flats about a mile away. How... how how do you fire a smart weapon at an airport that you can clearly see on a map and miss? By a mile. How do you how do you do that? What the fuck is going on? But you know, by the end of that opening barrage, Ukraine still has power, it still has internet and cell service, its anti-air defenses are still intact, its army is still able to mobilize, and it seems to be able to get numerous fighter aircraft into the air, regardless if you believe the ghost of Kiev story or not. It could also still make televised and radio broadcasts, its leaders could communicate with the outside world. In Desert Storm, the air campaign went on for five weeks. By then, tens of thousands of Iraqis had deserted or surrendered, and about 20,000 were dead. Air power alone had destroyed over a thousand tanks by this point. So, the coalition initial strategy during the ground campaign was to use heavy units to, to keep Saddam's forces pinned down, while the airborne units and paratroopers and the light mechanised forces from the French Foreign Legion performed these deep move strikes and set up forward operation bases and airfields to keep themselves supplied. Russia's strategy in Ukraine was to shut Ura and charge, and that went about as well as expected. I mean, Ukraine, like many of us, are probably sick of seeing Putin rush all his troops to the border every time he throws a fucking temper tantrum over whatever the fuck it is this time, was probably not expecting him to actually have the balls to invade. I was in the same boat. I was sitting in Spain visiting family, watching the news unfold, saying he'll never invade, he does this all the 
fucking time. Well, way to make me look bad. <sighs> I'm going back to Spain, by the way. Um, end of April, May, by the way. Just my mother is um, my mother's very, very sick, and I, I, I did want a laptop so I could work on videos while I'm out there. I'm going to try and maybe get a refurbished second-hand one somewhere because I'll be honest, I'm shit broke, and saying no to World of Tanks was not a sane financial decision. But <laughs> But, but you know I can't exactly sit here and talk about how Russian tanks are committing war crimes, then cut to an ad showing Russian tanks fighting through a ruined city. Which is annoying because I was kind of hoping for another World of Warship sponsorship at some point, you know, so I can demand payment in those Lego sets that they did that one time. I mean, I want one of those. <laughs> yeah. What was I saying? Ukraine, right, sorry. So... Sorry, I was thinking about Lego again. So, Ukraine's army is caught completely off guard. It has expected a missile bombardment and possibly an air campaign, so it was prepared for that. It has moved its anti-air defences and radar stations around it. Honestly, I don't know if Russia was acting on bad intel when it tried to shoot at them and missed, or if they were just looking at a map and just guessing where they might be, because honestly, at this point, either is a possibility. The actual ground invasion was not expected, but Ukrainian forces did everything correctly. They pulled back, fighting retreat style, out of artillery range. So the initial assault, the, the Russians seemed to gain a lot of ground very, very quickly. But this all appears to be part of the plan, because almost immediately they start taking losses. Not from the actual Ukrainian army, but local forces, the Ukrainian version of the National Guard, who's also doing exactly what they have been trained for. Ambushes, roadblocks, delaying tactics, doing everything to give the actual army time to prepare. And this is where you see those early stunning Ukrainian victories. Modernized T-72s and T-80s with their fancy new anti-anti-tank missile armor and systems that so-called every armored warfare expert was claiming made them equally deadly and threatening as modern-day tanks all get immediately destroyed by missile technology from the fucking 80s. Then a KA-52 showed up, you know, the alligator, one of the most powerful attack helicopters in the world, and it gets shot down by an infantry-launched missile from the fucking 80s. You know, the same missiles that were shooting down their previous generation of assault helicopters from the old retired because of that vulnerability. Oh, and just to be cheeky, Ukraine fires a missile back at Russia, hitting a major military airfield. Surprisingly, without killing any civilians in the process. Which is uh, somewhat astounding in this fucking war. So, so those amazing super advanced S-400s or whatever that everyone was shitting themselves over that can apparently detect and shoot down F-35s cannot detect or shoot down short-range ballistic missiles from the fucking 80s. Again, laser pig loop. That, that wasn't a meme. I, I really cannot emphasize just how backwards Russian military technology is. I, I know everyone creams himself over these impressive displays of Russian stuff is battle-hardened and rugged and, and not reliant on super advanced technology because they know what works. Well, fuck you, there you go. So all of this caused delays in the Russian columns, which meant the commando raids didn't get the reinforcements they needed to hold the two things it managed to take at this point, which was a cargo airport outside of Kiev and Odessa. Both got ruffle stomped by weekend soldiers and armed civilians. And now at this point, I'd sort of made half a video saying, you know, this is all good and well, but what we're seeing here is skinny 18-year-olds, guns with iron sights, decade-old tanks. What we're not seeing is the T-14s, the, the more modern T-90S series, the more modern well-armed troops. That we've seen them. We know Russia has them. Where the fuck are they? I, I was suspicious. I was expecting them to be massed up somewhere, letting the pawns go first to soak up all the flak, then the main bulk would move in behind, which I suspected was this big force moving in from the Chernobyl radiation fucked up technical sounding name zone. You know, the stalker zone. You, you know what the fuck I'm on about. What I wasn't expecting was that to actually be the main force. And Ukraine led them just straight into the meat grinder. Urban warfare is every general's nightmare, and, and at this point I thought they wouldn't be that stupid. They were. If you look at invasion maps of, like, Kiev, the Russians are attacking one side of the city and are, are pushing into the centre, which is the 
dumbest thing you can do. You assault a city by surrounding it. You lock it down. You assault from every angle. You minimize the enemy's ability to concentrate a defense in a single direction and remove their capability to resupply. You don't get all your troops formation marching as a gigantic fucking arrow and just charge. What fucking general gave that command? I mean, for fuck's sake, Hearts of Iron 4 players know not to do that. And when the lowest form of human intelligence on the planet is outsmarting you, it's time to consider you might be wrong. I mean, France and the UK were able to ship anti-tank weapons into Kiev just by sticking them on civilian trains. It's embarrassing to watch the great Russian war machine at work. And they still haven't achieved air superiority, and yet they are still trying to fly in paratroopers and supplies with their big stupid transport aircraft that Ukraine is literally shooting out of the sky, fucking duck hunt style. Oh, and they're doing more marine landings. Unsupported, attacking targets of no real strategical purpose. It's what, day five now? And the Russians' only single important gain is one naval base. And they continue to just be stupid. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm struggling to, to find anything. I, I genuinely thought, like, okay, Putin's playing 5D chess here. What's he got? No, he's, he's, he's not. It, it, this is just the most incompetent fucking organized war I've ever seen in my fucking life. And I struggle to use the word organized. They're attempting to land yet more paratroopers on the same airfield that just shot them down. So they tried again and got shot down. Tried a third time at Odessa and dropped a bunch of paratroopers into the ocean in the middle of winter. Where they all happily just fucking froze to death. Yeah, well done, Russia. God almighty, they're just... They're using main roads to travel around and falling for the same ambush over and over and over again. Big-ass transport planes haven't turned off their transponders, so you can just watch them in real time on fucking radar tracking websites. We're getting a lot of reports about Russian troops in Kiev. I should elaborate. The main force of Russian troops have yet to arrive in Kiev. After five days days. The fighting in Kiev has been largely between the Ukrainian National Guard, armed civilians, and Russian sabotage groups, some of which have been driving around in ambulances. That's a fucking war crime. Now, the bulk of Russia's forces have been stuck in place for about four or five days now. They've run out of fuel, they've run out of ammo, uh, their demoralized troops are basically surrendering or just walking away. To put that in perspective of just how bad Russian logistics are, Imagine they were invading the United States. I mean, fuck, it's World War III. The scenario envisioned by war gamers everywhere has come true. The Russians have invaded via Cuba, landing in Miami, broken through the defenders, and gotten exactly this far before running out of food, fuel, and ammunition. Oh, and it gets even better because the Russians keep trying to resupply their pin troops by driving large convoys of trucks down the same highway, the same highway all their tanks keep getting ambushed on. And you'll never guess, they're getting ambushed every fucking time. In fact, they are running out of trucks so quickly they've resorted to using civilian trucks. I mean, I just, oh my God. You know what, I think this is all down to just one key little thing that Russia seems to have completely forgotten exists. It's very small, and you might have heard of it. It's called the fucking internet. We live in a world where every single person has access to a device which can not only take almost perfect professional level photographs with no effort, they can also link to everyone else's device and share that photograph, meaning every single civilian in Ukraine is now basically an OSI intelligence agent. I mean, I've lost count of how many times just today alone I've seen on Instagram or TikTok images of Russian convoys or tanks, and with an hour I'm seeing the same convoy on fire having now been hit by an ambush, or bombarded by an aircraft, or fuck, just taken out by a drone. Russia wanted to sow the seeds of panic and confusion by its initial bombardment, but by not taking out power plants and cell towers, everyone in that country can still log on to Instant Messenger and talk to each other. Everyone can still communicate, everyone can still take photos of your military formations with a geotag attached to it, which can be beamed directly to some guy in an operations room who can then direct an airstrike. The thing is, this is not how the Russian military is supposed to perform. This is not how their doctrine works. This is not how they've been trained. If the Cold War had gone hot, this is 100% nothing close to an example of how Russia or the Soviet Union would have actually performed. I I'm honestly at a loss to explain it all. It's so outrageously ridiculous, but also just in general incompetent. 
And I, I'm assuming, just because his ego does tend to get in the way of things, the multi-star general with all the medals pinned to his chest that is responsible for this mess that we're looking for is Putin himself, who has aged about 20 years in the past three days. Now, I could be wrong, but I am pretty confident somewhere in the Kremlin there's a pre-minted medal he was planning to award himself once Ukraine capitulated. This is not an example of the Russian military, this is an example of the mastermind that is Putin at work, and I think it's time to address that. I mean, for years we have been enraptured by this cult of personality that Putin puts out, the propaganda that surrounds this man that carefully curates every second of his public appearance has led many to believe that this is a powerful, confident, strong individual, whereas the reality is he's just another musty old politician who stinks of mothballs and rotting testicles. Except he is also a semi-deranged fucker who puts anyone who disagrees with him into prisons. He's a bald, entitled, supremely unqualified fuck puppet whose money-hungry and power-hungry attitude has led him to lead a fantasy life where he grants himself every extreme luxury that none of the skinny 18-year-olds he just sent off to die could ever dream of affording even if every single person in the Russian army pulled together all the money they would make in their entire fucking lifetime. Not that it's going to matter for much longer, considering thanks to COVID, food shortages and the rapidly increasing poverty line combined with a slumlord crisis that has created an environment where many young people live in conditions that would make Skid Row seem luxurious by comparison, and adding to the fact that now three and a half thousand Russian mothers just woke up to find their sons have died, has just recreated the conditions of the fucking Winter Revolution. Now, it probably won't come to that. I, I fully expect Putin to just point randomly to one of his military advisors and say it's your fault, and then banish them or something. I don't know. But as you may suspect, a lot of people who would rather it was them that the internet makes all the badass manly memes about and gets to live in the billion dollar palace are currently circling like fucking sharks and making a lot of very interesting promises to very interesting people in quiet rooms to which there are a lot of in the Kremlin. So if or not Putin will still be president forever by the end of the month remains to be seen. He may step down gracefully, or he may just do a Stalin and mysteriously die. Who knows? I mean, what is clear, in fact, what is so blatantly obvious, I'm pretty sure Mike Sparks has worked it out, is that Putin has obviously expected this to be a lot easier than it actually was. Uh, he made the same mistake Hitler did. I just gotta kick the front door in and the whole rotting structure will come tumbling down. Or words to that effect, I forget the actual quote. Uh, but of course, what people are forgetting is he needed to wrap this up in about three days, surround Kiev, take a bunch of photos of Russian troops outside the presidential palace, force the government to flee, install a pro-Russia puppet government, and then sit back and wait till your lackey fucks everything up so badly that Ukraine is begging to become part of the Russian Federation. You go over three days, and well that's when NATO has finally decided what biscuits to serve at the meeting to decide if or not it should have an emergency meeting. And by day four, the UN has swung into action because all the busboys have finally found the last of the delegates and managed to prize them out of the bar and into their seats. We're now deep into the woods. NATO are starting to deploy. British tanks have arrived at Latvia, and a fuckload of Apaches are sitting in Poland, staring at those miles and miles of long convoys. Probably drooling. I'll be honest with you, a single flight of Apaches could probably end this war in about an hour, given how bunched up and out in the open the Russian convoys are. Though, uh, of course, what'll probably happen is an enforced no-fly zone, probably within the next few days, using the sheer amount of war crimes Russian pilots are committing as justification. Eastern Europe, on the other hand, has been ready to go since day one. I mean, like fuck do they want Russia on their borders, but so far everyone's only been happy to give weapons to Ukraine, ship weapons across the border, and let anyone who wants to fight, fight. But so far, no one's joined in. No one's rode to Ukraine's aid. No one's ready to attack Russia and risk their lives. Much easier to just let the Ukrainians die in the long-awaited proxy war. That may change, though. Eastern Europe, especially Poland, has been itching for this opportunity for quite some time. The Kraken awakes. And on given Russia's performance, Poland's much more organised, much more experienced, and much more modern army than Ukraine's would probably wipe the fucking floor with them. And the chances of that actually happening increase every day, which means that potentially very soon the commibus, or tankies as everyone seems to call them, may have finally have the wool pulled from their eyes as they realise that no, Russia cannot invade all of Europe 
plus America. They can barely invade one European country. But and of course, I could be wrong. Maybe the reason we're not seeing the T-14s, the, the newer T-90S models, the, the SU-57 Femboy, is because they're being held in reserve for something else and totally not because Russia can barely afford to actually deploy them. We'll get a clearer picture of what happened and what went wrong once the dust settles and when the serious people who have ties and are way smarter than me write their reports which I can use as a source as opposed to the various media websites which cite fucking Twitter as a main source. Until then, Slava de Krana. <laughs> Yippee, me, I'm a